First of all, may I say welcome to each and every one of you. It's great to see so many of you here. Uh, you are really, really welcome. Uh, my name is Steve Thornton. I'm Vice Principal for Health. And uh, I must say that uh, I always look forward to the inaugural lectures, uh, the lectures, uh, this one particularly. And I think partly because of the content, but partly because the inaugurals really give us the opportunity to combine so many different aspects of our lives. We can combine our work lives with social and family. And it's great to have Graham's family here today. It's great to see, well, to see and welcome Linda, um, who's a nurse, Charlotte, who's still at school. Um, Graham has another son, Jonathan, who uh, he had a choice to make uh, but staying and working in Amsterdam or coming to his father's in North Holland. <laughs> it, it was a very narrow decision that Jonathan chose to stay um, in Amsterdam. Um, so, it's, um, I ought to say a little bit about Graham actually. Um, so, um, Graham started his interest actually in electronics. And I understand that um, as a young child you were known more for taking the TV apart and um, understand the electronics of the, um, the TV. And uh, you, that set up your, um, your work in electronics and other areas. And uh, Graham originally wanted to go to a university in Kent and decided to come to Queen Mary um, for an interview. And uh, he was so impressed at the interview, how friendly and uh, how kind we were at that interview, that he ended up spending almost uh, all of the rest of his working life at Queen Mary. And I must say, um, to our advantage, and we were absolutely delighted that those that saw you at that interview were so kind to you. Um, <laughs> Graham's combined um, his work um, here with uh, medicine and has also worked extensively at the Royal London and uh, originally he did some work in medical electronics uh, focusing particularly on neurological disease. He became a full-time academic in 1987 and that followed a call from the um, then the dental dean. And I understand um, Graham's job was about to finish and the dental dean gave him in and said, Graham, we really want you to work here and by the way, can you start in two weeks' time? And that was Alan Brook who I think uh, made that call to you and um, Graham. And Alan sent his best wishes and I know he was really, really disappointed that he not be here tonight. You then start to work as an academic, start to work uh, in, uh, um, uh, in applying technology, particularly to teeth and working in um, carers. And then um, during a, a conference, you met Professor Tim <coughs> Weiss, who is the head or was the head of optometry and vision sciences. And uh, he asked you whether you could uh, apply some of your techniques to doing other things. Could you use those skills to visualize um, scrolls? Um, that had been damaged with time. And that, that culminated in your appearance on The One Show. I actually knew you when you said, oh, I haven't met you before um, earlier on. And uh, I knew that I knew you as well, not only from The One Show, but also I remember seeing you on Click when you'd restored some, um, some um, old material. And I hope that you're going to talk a little bit about that today. Graham, as well as having skills that he's applied to do unusual things like installing and um, archived materials, um, has also been an incredibly successful academic. I'm not going to run through all your successes, but they're, they're amazing. More than 100 papers um, that you've published and very high quality work that you've done during that time. Um, Graham also has a real interest in education as well as research particularly um, helping um, children and uh, um, uh, working with them um, on virtual reality and uh, other areas. And he also works very hard on the delivery of postgraduate taught um, courses. I know from, uh, from chatting that he's a very keen runner and uh, also um, is uh, very into cycling. So I won't hold up your lecture anymore. It's an absolute pleasure to introduce you. Um, so ladies and gentlemen, uh, Professor Graham Davis, who's going to give his inaugural lecture tonight on Teeth, Scrolls and Eric inside the world of 3D X-ray microtomography. Graham, thank you. Thank you everybody for coming. Um, it, it's fantastic to see so many people from different 
areas of my life. I've never sort of seen them fall together in one place. So it's, uh, it's a shame we're going to talk to them. <laughs> but really, you know, brief overview, actually. I, I still remember, I guess it was 1976. I started at Queen Mary in 1977, so I'm guessing it could have been early 77 or 76. I came for that famous interview. And I remember, I still remember the sort of thought process going through my head. Being a very sort of logical minded sort of person, you know, I'd, I'd been through the prospectuses because you, you couldn't download things in those days. And uh, Queen Mary was number two on the list. And, but that evening after the interview, I just had this overwhelming feeling that I had to be a Queen Mary. And uh, I didn't believe in God or anything at, at that time. I thought maybe something inside me knows something my conscious mind doesn't or something. <laughs> Let's think through this logically. If I think about this logically, I am going to bias it in such a way that I will go to Queen Mary. So why don't we just forget it and, and just change the application and, and that's how Queen Mary became number one on the list. Now, getting involved in dentistry was another sort of accident. Well, not exactly an accident. I had a year's teaching post that was coming to an end, and although they said they were going to renew it, they hadn't actually got any funding, and they were sure it was going to come, but it got to two weeks before the end of contract. Mm. <laughs> and uh, it hadn't appeared. And I had this phone call from somebody called Alan Brook, who I'd never heard of before, uh, and never had anything to do with dentistry. And he said, there's a, a research assistant post going, um, would you be interested? And I said, well, if you can get me a post in two weeks, uh, then yes, I would. Uh, and that was my interview. Uh, and being involved with dentistry turns out to be probably the best career choice I didn't make. Um, and one of the things that, that happened there was that I started off looking at electronic caries uh, detection. But I just happened to be working in the same lab as uh, Jim Elliott, sadly no longer with us. And uh, he was working on something called X-ray mic microtomography, or CT, micro CT. And his interest was in the chemistry of the, the mineral that makes up our teeth. And what happens to that mineral when you have caries or tooth decay? How do you actually measure that? How do you know? how much mineral is lost, uh, which is uh, very important if you want to think about how to put it back again. And one of the ways you can do that is with x-rays. I should probably, I guess everybody has probably had an x-ray at the dentist. I've probably had too many of them. Um, and the brighter parts, you know there's more mineral in the x-ray beam there. The problem is there's two reasons why it's brighter here, or why it's darker in other places. One is it could be that the actual mineral density, or the mineral concentration is higher. So that's a good healthy bit of tooth. Um, this is the enamel, you can see around the outside of the tooth, the crown of the tooth. But the other reason is that there's just more of it. <coughs> the, there's the path length through that bit of enamel is longer. And these two bits of information get combined. So you can't actually look at one thing and say, well, measure exactly what the mineral density or the mineral concentration is at that point because you don't know how thick it is. Jim then reasoned that with CT scanning, which came along in the 1970s, um, you can separate these two things out. You get, as it were, a cross-section, um, in this case through the brain. They're originally known as brain scanners because they're used almost exclusively for head scans. Now we just call them CT scanners. And this gives you this nice cross-section. And the thing about this is, when you measure the sort of density in any of these regions, it's now no longer dependent on the geometry, at least in the ideal case. Um, and if you could use this technique on teeth, he could measure the mineral concentration, which is what he wanted to do. And so came up with microtomography. This was in 1980 this slide was made of a small water snail. I'm not even going to try and pronounce that. Um, but actually, his real interest was teeth. It was a very slow system. See, this took about 
uh, three hours. That, that was fairly fast, actually. It was a single slice, only 64 by 64. Uh, I'm not sure what fraction of a megapixel that is, but it, it's not very much. It was one very low resolution slice. <coughs> But it was much higher resolution than could be done in medical CT scanners, that's the point. And it was very, very accurate in terms of measuring the precise mineral concentration. And that to him was the most important thing. One of the things I learned about you, or perhaps many aspects <coughs> failed to learn, well, was that he was very much focused on the scientific problem at hand. And he developed the sort of minimal amount of equipment needed to solve that problem. Whereas I was sort of the gadget builder, and, and I would do something because I could. He was much more <coughs> focused than that. So he would spend ages trying to get him to upgrade his computer to Windows. And he would say, well, will it help me write more papers or faster? Then, then why bother? Um, that, that was something else I failed to learn from him. Um, but I sort of, I, I guess the other guy's research is always more interesting. I, I sort of slowly shifted along sideways and got drawn into the microtomography. Um, that first collaborative work was done with David Dover at King's College. Um, but at this time, PCs, I, I know it's hard for some of the young ones to think that there was a time when we didn't have PCs, but they were getting powerful enough, we thought, to actually be able to do the mathematics of reconstruction for CT on a computer. The C in, in computer tomography, by the way, is, is very important. You, you have to, it's a sort of mathematical calculation that forms these pictures. Um, and in time, um, I sort of took over the processing and put it onto a PC. It may have been the first time that was done on a PC, I, know, I never bothered to check, but nobody else seemed to be doing it. But as time moved on, um, so, microtomography was, was catching on. Other people were doing it. There was probably, uh, in the early-ish 1980s, there would have been, um, or 90s at least, <coughs> one commercial system I was aware of, uh, and a few maybe odd labs around the place. And they moved on from Jim's system, which had just a single collimated beam collecting one point at a time, to so these area detectors, more like the sort of cameras, electronic cameras we have nowadays, except this was an X-ray camera. And instead of collecting one point at a time, now you could collect a million points at a time. This was now very much faster. The difference being that you weren't measuring the energy, so the, the actual accuracy wasn't as good, but it was orders of magnitude faster. We worked out that with Jim's system, to collect a data set that was 512 cubed, uh, because now we're collecting volumetric images, would have taken about 40 years. Um, the good news is that we, had we decided to do that, we'd be pretty much three quarters of the way there by then. <laughs> um, but these can do it in some of the third generations nowadays, we'll do that in 15, 20 minutes. That's a bit of a difference. Um, now, as I said, I, I wanted to go one better. I mean, we, we could have built our own system then. Um, but there was a problem with these third generation scanners. At least I perceived it as a problem. I don't have time now to go into all the details, but they suffered from something called ring artifacts. And that's because the every pixel of the X-ray detector is very slightly different from those next to it. What you do when you, you do tomography is you rotate, uh, in microtomography, you rotate the specimen as it's in the X-ray beam. You may take a thousand, perhaps a few thousand images of that as you rotate it around. You feed all that into a computer program that then gives you the entire volume in 3D of that object. In that mathematical process, the way these differences in detector sensitivities pan out is that they give you these ring artifacts. They are very difficult to get rid of. And the problem is, depending on what you're imaging, you're, in getting rid of them by some sort of software 
processing akin to Photoshop, you might actually take out something that's supposed to be there. And it also puts a limit on the sensitivity as well. The medical scan has got around this by going to fourth generation, which I'm not going into there, but making a fourth generation micro CT scan that wasn't possible. And um, what I did was to come up with uh, what's called the time delay integration scanner. And I don't know if this is going to move slides or if it's actually, oh, it is going to start. This was, we started working on this in the early 90s, or mid-90s, where we actually moved the, the camera through the x-ray beam. And the way that these cameras work is they read out in this direction, and you're simultaneously moving the camera in one direction, reading it out in the other direction, and that sort of averages out all those differences in detector sensitivities. And we signify the artifacts. I was presenting this once at a conference. Now, it wasn't actually during my presentation, but the subject of ring artifacts did come up. And one of the questions was, who cares? Fortunately, that wasn't a question I'd actually asked myself. <laughs> uh, because it turned out that, apart from not, getting, not just getting rid of ring artifacts, there was another trick with this. We could just do longer and longer exposures and get better and better quality images with more contrast resolution that enabled us to detect much smaller changes in mineralization. And that's led to all sorts of variations in the research that we've done uh, that have made this unique. And it wasn't really something I set out to do again, but it, uh, it just happened to work. This is typical of the sort of work we might do. Now this is, as I said, we've got the whole volume of the tooth now. Once we've got this 3D data set, we can slice it in any direction we like. Uh, this is a vertical slice through a tooth. And the nice thing about this is it's completely non-destructive. Uh, same with medical CT scanning. Um, so, having scanned a tooth once, you can take the tooth away. We, we can't do this in patients, by the way. I should have said that earlier. It's not a clear <coughs> uh, The X-ray dose, if you scale this sort of up, if you wanted this quality image in a live patient, the X-ray dose would probably vaporise them. <laughs> you know, we're not talking about just being in the red. Uh, so, extracted teeth only. It's, it's, it is a research tool. There's a few systems on the market that can do small animals, but that's about it, and the, the image quality isn't great. But this sort of quality image, just forget it. It won't happen. And that's the laws of physics that dictate that. It's not a technological limit. I have a hard time explaining that to students sometimes, because you always think that in time, we can do everything. You look at the progress we've made over the years, and they say, yeah, how long before we see this in the clinic? It's very hard to say it won't happen, because you need X number of photons, and that will kill somebody. But that's, that's physics for you, I'm afraid. Can't change that. Um, so here we've got this carries again, this decay. You can see it's cavitated here. Um, and the dark level here is this demineralization. This, for those of you who aren't familiar with seeing uh, cross-section XMT images of teeth, which is probably quite a few of you, I suppose. Uh, this is enamel here, the bright white part, and it's bright because that's got the most mineral. That's the hardest part of the tooth. The dentine is a little bit softer. This gives the tooth its toughness, um, and it's got less mineral, hence it's a bit darker. And we can easily see that distinction. It's not supposed to be like this. Okay, that should be uniform across there. This is acid diffusing in through here. And um, what we call that demineralization. It's demineralized the tooth, it's dissolved it. Not a good thing. So, a dental student excavated this tooth after scanning. We put it back in again, we align the images afterwards, and we can see precisely uh, the cavity that it's made. And we can look at that any way we like, we can look at it in three dimensions. Um, Dave, don't forget to wave at me if I'm going on too long. You have to really get my attention there. Okay. Um, and the other thing you can do is we can subtract those two images, one from the other, and actually look at the material 
removed. And there is this trend in dentistry. I don't know, I still don't know a lot about dentistry. I think I'd already gone from electronics to neurology by the time I started dentistry. And I think my brain was full by then. So it's taken a long, long time to learn anything about teeth. Um, but there is this move towards um, less invasive dentistry, minimally, minimally invasive. Um, and one could argue that perhaps some of this dentin that's being removed is fairly healthy. Now, we shouldn't really use our eyes just to judge the grey level there, whether that's healthy or not. We can actually measure this very precisely and give it marks out of 10 or whatever. But actually, you did a better job than I did, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. This is just one slide illustrating, I'm just sort of breezing through the research here. I have no idea what the time is because that looks is 5 to 10 or whatever, 5 to 11. Um, but this was a study on crown preparation. It's showing some of the ways we can present that 3D data. So if anyone's had crowns before, I've had a few too many of those as well. Um, the tooth has been prepared by shaving off, for want of a better term, shaping it to this shape. So this is the original shape of the tooth outside here. And we got that shape from the initial scan. It was then prepared. It would be put into a dummy head to try and simulate the very awkward working conditions that um, you know, working type spaces as dentists have to do. And following that, we scanned it again to get this shape. But this was a study on the thickness of dentine that remains between the prepared surface and the pulp chamber of the tooth. Now that distance shouldn't be too low. You shouldn't get too close to the pulp chamber when you're preparing the crown. Everything coloured white there is two millimetres, and that's what the literature says you should have. I don't know how they're going to manage that, because this tooth didn't even have two millimetres to start with in places. So that's what the purple colour there means. It's just a little bit under two millimetres. What it sh certainly shouldn't do is go into the red. Mm. Okay, so this has been colour-coded. We've mathematically measured the distance, because what you can't see here is the internal shape of the pulp chamber. But we've measured the distance from that and colour-coded it accordingly. And yeah, anything sort of beyond green is really quite bad news. Now we can't do this in patients unfortunately, but what you could, something you could do with this is maybe um, use it for training. Actually, we, we could, and changing techniques, learning about techniques, what they do. And that's a follow-up study that hasn't happened. I can't remember when this was done. It was a little while ago. We're still waiting to do that one. Moving on. Another treatment I've had too many of, root canal treatment. This was a PhD project uh, looking at voids in root canal treatment. Now when you treat a root, you excavate to expose the pulp, you remove the soft tissue from inside, um, you clean the sides of the root canals, and then you fill it with the material. And the idea is that you don't leave any spaces, because that's where um, bacteria can colonize and the tooth can become reinfected. These green bits represent voids. They should be there. We started that project. We had the, the, the research question was why do 15% of root canal fillings fail? Now after you've scanned a whole load of root canal fillings, your question sort of becomes how on earth do 85% succeed? <laughs> X-ray microtomography study of art. Uh, now, this isn't the kind of art that you find in a gallery. Um, it stands for atraumatic restorative treatment. Now, we think dentists are bad enough in this country, but we are actually very lucky. Uh, we, we do take things for granted in the Western world. If you are in vast, perhaps two thirds of the world, um, and you get toothache, it's probably going to be treated with a pair of pliers. 
uh, and you know we sort of worry about aesthetics and things like that. One of the concepts behind, behind atraumatic restorative treatment was that it was designed to be used somewhere where perhaps you didn't have electricity, even running water, uh, so no um, pneumatic instruments or anything like that. You use a hand excavator to scrape out decayed material and a filling material that is just pushed into place, mixed and pushed into place. It's as simple as that. Although that was the original design, of course it was found that, um, you know, especially when you're dealing with children, the atraumatic bit uh, has real advantages. And this was um, a master student, Amal Shamar, who um, had a look at this. <coughs> this is a tooth uh, that he prepared. I should have been talking over this one, actually, because it's very slow moving. Uh, this has been scanned with X-ray microtomography and then rendered and turned into a movie. So it's just one of the ways that we can present data. Uh, that's the fitting. You can see it's not, you know, beautifully done. This is how it might be done in those sort of conditions without electricity and so on. And here we've just made the enamel and, and the filling invisible, as we can do that, just to show the extent of the cavitation. And then we can make the dentine invisible, turn it over the other way, and you can see the filling from the other side. Now this particular material is designed to slowly release strontium into the dentin that's left behind. And that actually promotes remineralization. I won't go into the, all the details of that now, but as we slice through the data here, so we're not actually physically doing anything to the tooth, this is just a virtual slicing. This is the area here that's of interest. This is sort of demineralized dentin. You couldn't remove all this because to do so would have exposed the pulp. And that's bad news. So this was left behind. And if we look at a cross section of that, so this is from another XMT scan, we can follow what happens so over time. So this is going to release strontium. If we look at it one week later, it looks like that, which looks very similar. If we subtract one from the other, you can see a lot of these little things here where bubbles have got filled with liquid and they're sharp. But this is the real interesting thing here. If we turn the contrast up, you can see this light area here and a dark area here. That represents strontium migrating from the filling material uh, into the dentine. And as we watch that over time, you can see it getting brighter. Uh, so that's something uh, we, we can actually follow that process happening. And we can look at different materials and compare one with the other. So that's sort of ongoing work, uh, something that we'll be doing a lot of in the future. The software I use actually was written by a brilliant person called Ajay Limay at um, Australian National University that we used to make some of these images from the tomographic data. And this we call a rendered view. Um, you, you can sort of play around with the colouring a bit. It's, it's a wonderful way to waste time, actually. Yeah. What colour is the tooth going to be today? So you can tell sort of what mood I was in, maybe, when I did this one. Um, so we have this nice orangey yellow colour for dentine and white for enamel. The interesting thing is, is that um, the calculus that forms on the roots is actually more mineralised than the calculus that forms on enamel, for those that know what I'm talking about. Um, and so the calculus on enamel comes out the same colour as dentine, and the calculus on dentine comes out the same colour as enamel, which is um, something to follow up maybe. What this is going on here, I really don't know. Okay, I think Dave's trying to tell me something. Let's move on. This has been hacked about. Um, every tooth tells a story. We can see this. Here, that, that's the bit that had been gouged somehow. I don't quite know what was going on there. And um, these traces here show how the pulp has reacted to it. The dentine has microscopic tubules going through it. That's, and mineral has been deposited down these. So we can actually say, as a result of that, 
all this has happened here, dentin's starting to be laid down, there's all sorts of things going on there. So in 3D we can relate any sort of external assault to what's going on inside the enamel. My Dave's going to start waving frantically at me so. We've also looked at a, a couple of uh, genetic disorders. This one, dentinogenesis imperfecta, is um, a problem with the formation of dentin. The pulp chamber of the tooth, which should be a big sort of black area here, gradually disappears completely. Um, and it also affects the enamel uh, that often breaks away, as has happened in this one. This one's worse because the tooth has probably been allowed to dry out. So it wouldn't be that bad while it was in the patient. But nevertheless, uh, it does tend to break away uh, even more still in the patient. The question is though, why do these teeth become infected? Um, if there's no pulp chamber left, how, how, does, the, how does the infection migrate from here? All right, maybe you've got a crack in the enamel, but it's not going to go anywhere. There's no pulp chamber for it to go to. But if you look at these little holes, you can't make much of them in a slice, but when you look at them in 3D, you can see that these are actually the remnants of nerve fibres and blood vessels, and they are connected. And if we sort of move that around backwards and forwards, uh, you can just see that in 3D. So that provides a pathway for bacteria to pro propagate through and maybe helps us solve that mystery. A little speculative, but it's our best guess. This one, I'm just going to show this very briefly. This is a uh, man deeps there somewhere. This is uh, uh, a research student, and she's done some incredible work on very laborious work. This is a, an archaeological tooth um, from. Uh, an infant, uh, sadly. This this was never fully mature, this tooth, uh, before, before death. If we turn the contrast up, you can see a growth line here. And this is probably a period of illness um, that affected the formation of the tooth. And I said to Mandy, could you just put some markers around this in 3D? As, as you go through the slices. So this, this is sort of what she did. That's just one slice. Have a little count up, Mandy. Do you know any idea how many dots you put there? <coughs> it was 12,208. <laughs> <coughs> yeah, quite impressive. And then she did the outside as well, on top of that. But as a result of that, we get a snapshot of what the tooth looked like at an earlier stage in its development. And this shows the inner one, shows that early stage, and the outer one is at least the, the, uh, the shape of the tooth that, as it would have been at death. Um, so we can actually sort of see two, the, the, the tooth in two different stages of development simultaneously. So this is hot off the press. I, I made that movie this morning and I should have been rehearsing what I was going to say. <laughs> Let's move on. I'm just going to briefly mention this one. It looks like something out of a sci-fi movie. This is one of the many projects that I've done with um, Professor Alan Boyd. Unlike most of them, this one actually got published. Um, and these are high-density mineralized protrusions coming from a human femoral head. Let's give you another view of it here. Alan originally found these in race horses, uh, but then we, we scanned um, a human femoral head and, and a family Alan's also seen them now in, in humans. And this is much more mineralized than bone. I'm not going to say too much because I'll get myself in trouble and he's sitting in the audience. Um, but these things fracture, they, they break up, so you've got this very brittle material uh, that's going to grind away the articulate surfaces. So um, that's not good news. If you want to know more about that, talk to Alan later. <coughs> One of those chance encounters though, and I guess I'm going to speed up a little bit, um, was 2006 meeting Tim West, who asked me if I might be able to read ink or detect ink in damaged scrolls. Now animal skin is, it turns out, is good for two things. You can sort of stretch it 
and dry it and chemically treat it, you can make parchment with it. Or you can boil it up and make glue. And in fact, collagen, uh, which makes up animal skin, is, is a Greek for source of glue. Um, the trouble is that if your parchment isn't kept in perfect conditions, oops, this is looking bad, um, those two things get, get muddled. Tim gave me a little sample of parchment. I rolled it up, put it in the scanner, created this movie, <coughs> I sent it to him, and he thought I'd actually done something with it, with it you know, sliced it up or something. And I said, no, this was done with x-rays. From that, we, we got EPSRC funding with us, ourselves and Cardiff University um, to actually look at historical scrolls, to design a, a new scanner. Um, and the EPSRC put out very early on in that, long before we, we started the work, but after it had been funded, they put out a press release. And that had an immediate impact on somebody anyway, as this film shows. Lewis. Come in, Thank you, Professor. Well, you'll be money. I've never have had you down as a detective, Mr. Hathaway. I've really never had you down as a Bernie. Bernie. <laughs> I do like you. Actually, it's a Bernie's. I appreciate you seeing me like this. No, I'm not sure. I want to have a bloody word. Well, I thought in view of your expertise in deciphering this. Well, let's have a look at it. Big fan of your work on the Dead Sea Scrolls. Actually, it will get you everywhere. Actually, I've been superseded by a brilliant newfangled x ray machine in the case of the scrolls that are too delicate to one go. I'll cry from scrabbling around the Judean desert with my glass. <laughs> <laughs> Probably not coincidental, I don't think. <laughs> Gary Tucson from the Norfolk Record Office. This is another film. Piecing together the daily later, lives of years later. Years. Right, show me what you've got. Well, this is from Melbourne Bressingham. Right. Oh, Take it down a little bit. So this is from like 1409, 1410. Oh, so it's 600 years old. 100 years old, yep. Yeah. So can you unroll it any further? We can't. Get any further, I'm afraid. Why not? Well, in the past, this document is not that, and the parchment of it is infused together. We can't go any further. We sort of disintegrate, and we would never be able to find out what's written again. Six hundred years ago, Bressingham Manor in East Anglia was home to four hundred people. Gary hopes this scroll will give him a glimpse into their day-to-day -day lives. The Bressingham scroll is the first to undergo a new technique pioneered here at Queen Mary University in London. But these guys aren't specialists in record keeping or art history. It's a dental school. <laughs> Dr. Graham Davis has developed a super sensitive x ray machine that looks like light. <laughs> 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 Just one fiftieth of a millimetre apart. That's a fraction of a human hair. But now he's turned the technology to looking inside ancient scrolls too. The ink that was commonly used in medieval times contains iron. Um, so in the same way that we see calcium in bones, we can see iron in the ink because it's a heavy element. And it shows up more in x-rays compared with the parchment that it's written on. The machine scans very fine slices of the scroll and then builds them up into a digital model made up from 11 billion 3D pixels. The scan scroll is still rolled up, but Dr. Paul Rosen from the University of Cardiff has worked out an ingenious way to unwrap it digitally. So, Paul, what is this image here? What do you do with it? So we get literally 10,000 X-ray cross-sections, which are showing a cross-section through the scroll as we go along them and put the scroll. And they have uh, this bright outline, which is the parchment, and then the very bright points correspond to ink. Right, so you've got a sort of a, a slice through the, the roll, yes. and these little blind splotches, that's actually the ink. That's right, so in all these cross sections we have to extract out the parchment, we have to do the unrolling, 
we have to take all the intensities and then stick them all together to form the resulting image. It's taken months to carefully line up thousands of these tiny slices. Today, Paul is going to show archivist Gary the result. If it's readable, it will be a world first. Okay, Paul, let's have a look. It's been 600 years since this has been read. So, this is what we can see before. Yes, and now. Wow! That's really good. That's correct. The will is anticipated. So, can you read any of this here? Yeah, well, this is dealing with the set of fishing rods. Someone called William Skeet. Do we know who William Skeet is? And William Skeet is named just the Reeve. It was, if you like, he's the estate manager. So, the estate manager sold himself the fishing rods. Yes. Yeah. That's the way it was. Gary's scroll is only the beginning. In the near future, it's hoped this technique will be able to unravel more of history's hidden secrets. All right, I'd better press on very quickly for accelerated ending. Um, because not long after that, there was another new challenge. Um, Charles Norton, a producer, came to me with a problem, um, which Dave and I, Dave is my colleague who joined me for the sort of scrolls project, uh, and then managed to get a permanent place here, because we, we like him, we get on well. <laughs> and uh, um, he explained a problem called vinegar syndrome, where the old films on, um, on acetate, uh, the acetate, if it's not stored in ideal conditions, if it gets a bit damp and humid, breaks down to acetic acid, otherwise known as vinegar. And if your films start to niff a little bit of vinegar, um, thank you, Dave. Um, You've got problems. Mm. It's uh, once th this process starts, it very quickly um, degenerates. The presence of seeking acid itself is sort of self-catalyzing. Not only in that film, um, it's it's also sort of contagious. So the film emulsion, where where all the pictures are turns to goo, the pictures go soft. You can't unreal it because you'll just destroy it. The whole film will eventually just become soup. And you don't want to keep it um, in the archive because those fumes will sort of infect other films and start the process there. It's like it's got some deadly contagious disease. So they, they get put in a skip very quickly. Uh, if it's too late to run it through a projector or make a copy of it, then that, that's too bad. It turns out that the second ever episode of the Morecambe and Wise show, originally um, recorded on videotape, uh, and the BBC in those days, just like all of us did with VHS, you know, after you've seen something you've recorded over it. Um, an old copy of it had been sent to Nigeria or somewhere where they didn't have videotapes, so it had been transferred to 16mm black and white film. It ended up sort of in a shed, for want of a better term. It had got damp and hideous, and um, basically it didn't, there wasn't a hint of vinegar. If, if you opened that, lid. You wouldn't want to breathe anywhere near it, as Dave would testify. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I said to Charles when he was explaining this, well send us some film and we'll have a go. And this was the first attempt, just a straightforward x-ray of a, a bit of Snow White. It's a German Snow White film. You can just about see that there is an image on there. It doesn't really show up very well on x-ray. The, the image is made of silver in the dark parts and that's why we, we can see it at all. Uh, so we didn't have a lot of hope, but we, we thought we'd scan the film anyway uh, with, with a full microtomography scan. And the results were more promising than we expected. And I'm going to breeze through this fairly quickly. This is another film. This is the introduction to the British Beaumont News. Um, it's rolled up into a 35mm film canister. We scanned it like that. This is the 3D um, or a section through the 3D slice. If you imagine it's like a Swiss roll, and this is what happens when you cut the Swiss roll edgeways, and you actually just make out there. But, but your knife isn't really the right shape to follow the, the contours of it. Um, and I devised a program because Paul Rosen, who's the expert at Cardiff at the time, was tied up. I asked him if he could do anything with this, and uh, 
at the time he was too busy, so I sort of shut my door for a couple of days and hid away with computer programming. Uh, Linda knows that to talk to me after a, a day, day's computer programming is at best fruitless and at worst dangerous. <laughs> <laughs> but if you define a slice through the top and the bottom of that, um, and then you define a centre, you just guess where the centre is, click on it with a mouse, click on another point here. What the computer program does, it assumes that this is, follows a spiral, at least for a little way. And a spiral is like drawing a circle, but the radius changes as you go around. Either it goes up, or it goes down, by an unknown amount. You do the same top and bottom. And what you do is, math in the computer program, you weigh it for a little bit. You change that just one parameter that says how fast it's going down or up. You wiggle it backwards and forwards. Uh, one. And you do the same with the bottom. If you join those two together, you've defined this curve right through the whole film. And you wiggle them both, that's another word for optimization, <laughs> until you maximize the amount of silver that you've got in that image. And when you've done that, you swap these points around so your starting point is here and you move on to the next one. And you let that process go. And it gradually, you can see the red line tracking around, and as it does so, it's reeling through uh, the film. If you take the same path, go a little bit deeper in, you get nice images of the sprockets, which tell you where the frames are, a bit of not very good distortion correction, and you can actually get a frame out of that. But what about sound? This actually had an optical soundtrack on it. Um, if you measure the width of that and feed it into an audio program, you can recover the sound. <laughs> it would be lovely if we could do that with a more common wise form. Sadly, to scale that up for film is a bit like scaling up for patients. We don't want to vaporise the film. It's had a hard enough time already. Mm -hmm. um, so that would be impossible. And I, I told Charles, um, even, even if we could conceive of a scanner that had 20,000 pixels across, the X-ray exposure would have to be 10,000 times greater, dimensional stability, you, know, you don't want anything moving even though you're heating it up. Uh, dynamic range of the detectors just becomes impossible because you need this massive exposure. Uh, so with this film, it looks like this, you can see it's already started to turn to go. You take the lid off and it blows your head off with the stench of vinegar. Uh, lost forever. I said, well, the only thing you could do is chop it into little bits and scan each bit individually. And without hesitation, Charles just said, do it, because this film is going to be soup. Uh, and the alternative was to just put it in the skip now. So I presented this <laughs> to conservationists. Uh, and the golden rule of conservation is you don't do anything that you can't undo, like this. <laughs> Now, Dave and I have discussed that it would be a really good idea if we had a femtosecond laser, and again, I don't have time to describe what that is, but it means that there wouldn't be so much heat generated. But the advantage of this is that it actually fuses the sides together, because you've only got to slide those two, two surfaces of the film a little bit, and you've ruined the picture. So by fusing these together, you've sort of cauterized the wound, as it were. You've made a solid lump that you can then take out and handle. I hadn't realised a lot later that we had that advantage. Uh, it would have been better if it didn't catch fire occasionally. <laughs> <laughs> so this is what a block looks like after it's been scanned. That's a cross section, one way through it, through the Swiss rolls as it were. I had an early go at, at sort of trying to make sense of this. Again, you haven't got that nice curvy blade that will allow you to follow the contours through it. So here was a, a sort of attempt. What you can see down here going on 
is I'm starting to sort of bend my blade, as it were, around the contours of it, first in one dimension and then the other. And as I do so, mm -hmm. images are appearing here. You might recognize that. Mm -hmm. um, in the early days, this was fascinating. I, I mean, when I first saw Eric's face appear here, I just made a, knew I had this sort of Cheshire cat grin on my face. <laughs> uh, you just couldn't help it. Any doubts about whether I was wasting taxpayers' money by spending time was immediately evaporated. <laughs> um, and here I'm just refining that. I'm sort of scrolling in and out and clicking all points that are part of the same frame. Uh, and this software program will, will then gradually um, resolve the film. I think I'm down, Alex. I'm sorry. I'll skip through this very quickly. Charles played around with this software for ages and managed to recover them. And then after he'd spent you know, basically lost the world to live. <laughs> Spending hours and hours on this, I, I refined it and made it semi-automatic. Uh, and then someone else from BBC, uh, Adam from BBC R&D, then said, uh, I, you know, I think we could probably do the whole stack in one go. And at that point, I really had wasted enough time. Why well, do you have to draw attention to the there, is there, isn't it? I happen to be minded to Bing Crosby's voice, and beautifully as well. Not your word out of sync. No, I'm not miming now, it's Bing's. <laughs> you realise, of course, the tape stopped. Yeah, yeah, well, well of course he stopped. He started, started again. You, how does he do it? It's a thrill working with a small little genius. <laughs> now, we didn't recover the sound on that one. Somebody <coughs> made a, a sort of very illegal recording of it, which uh, BBC were very glad of. Um, but that was actually putting together some of the recovered images. And the good thing is, now we've got that data, in time, they, they can play with it and refine it. Who knows what they've come up with. I'm just going to show this very briefly. I know you should be having refreshments now. This week we started with a snail with Jim's 1980 work. This is 38 years later. The remake never has the impact of the original film. I, I've never known the film. But here we are anyway. This is one of Dave's. Well, Dave, Dave has a thing for snails. This is one of his ex snails. <laughs> what it's like to live inside a snail shell. <laughs> <laughs> could do a clean <laughs> uh, And my flying is not too good so I do some this. <laughs> and finally, the strangest thing I have ever seen in a tooth. Following images are from teeth with dentinogenesis imperfecta. There, there is no trickery in this. So this is another orangey, it was another orange day. Um, scan of a tooth, you can see that even the enamel is affected on this one. And one of the things about these teeth is they generate these pulp stones inside. And over time, the uh, dentine encroaches on the pulp space, and these pulp stones just become incorporated into the dentine. We were scanning through the slices of this data, and Dave said, why is there a face? <laughs> now, the chances of, I, I do teach critical thinking, and so humans are very good at seeing patterns, and I accept. Like, you look at enough clouds, and sooner or later you're going to see a camel or whatever, a mouse or whatever, it, it's great fun. I still do that. So sooner or later you're going to see a face, but what's the probability of seeing a particular face uh, in a tooth. <laughs> if you can answer that one, then. <laughs> and that, that, that is a, a, you know, an unphotoshopped cross section. <laughs> Bizarre. Now this is a coward slide, okay, Be because there are so many people I've been looking around that I have so many uh, people to thank um, that I wouldn't fit them on the slide and I was terribly afraid that if I missed somebody out, which I undoubtedly would, I would offend somebody, so I decided not to name anyone, just to say thank you to everybody here and a lot of people who aren't here um, who've, yeah, really, you know, contributed so much. Uh, and, and it's not just the academics, you know, some of the giant academics on whose shoulders I stand, uh, and my colleagues, and of course my family, running colleagues who uh, keep me sane, 
uh, just slightly insane at the same time. Uh, so thank you to everybody. Sorry for not naming you there. Um, it's the fairest way. <laughs> thank you very much. And lastly to say that um, the, the mention of virtual reality in children hasn't actually happened yet. It's something I'm working towards. And there is going to be a demonstration of that. This is what it looks like. If you're feeling brave and want to step inside into it. One of the ways of making dental anatomy more interesting, if you like, will be to make a massive hollow model of a tooth the size of a skyscraper and then walk around inside it. <coughs> That's sort of what we do in virtual reality. So Dave and, and Alex, hopefully, if it works, will be demonstrating that later. So uh, thank you very much. <laughs> so, uh, how do I sum that up? I'm not even going to start. Um, I think it's just an absolutely fabulous lecture, and thank you for sharing uh, that with us. Um, so interesting to see the application of the technique to so many different areas, from dentistry to film. Just amazing, you know, just looking around, just uh, everyone captivated. So, absolutely amazing. It is, um, it is standard not to have. Um, questions after an inaugural, but Graham's very kindly said that if there are any questions, very happy to answer. So just before we uh, we retire for uh, drinks and um, a, a light bite, then um, I have to take any questions. Yeah, for example, the, um, you've got a bit of so if you've covered it already, I apologise. You mentioned Dead Sea Scrolls. The calculating scrolls and the inadvertence and the receivers of options. How much will this technique help you? Um, it depends on the ink. It, if it's a sort of carbon-based ink, it's almost completely extra transparent. The sort of medieval ink, which is much later than they die, and that's much more hopeful. But there was a, a publication, I can't remember what it was now, where somebody had looked at something, I think it was a Hercules <coughs> scroll, and they found traces of lead in it, which would be very encouraging. So there are other people working on it. We, we've never looked at anything as exotic as, as that of Dead Sea Scrolls. Um, the Breast of the Manor was the, the most exotic thing we've looked at so far. We were sort of working our way in gently up there. There's a problem with that, because it's been rolling in wet, and the medieval scroll, but because of these, of course, they're carbonized. So yes, they, yeah. They come to dust if you yeah. try to open them. So. I, I think the problem there would, would be moving it as well. They were, our our X-ray system weighs a couple of tons. <laughs> Um, so we could take it to them, and they wouldn't want to take it to us. Um, no, you could just you could build one yeah. in the Portici and actually use it on the site. Yeah, I, I mean, I think we were asked about that when we actually wrote um, the grant application for this. You know, the system, the, the new system, was about five tons. Somebody said, "Could you could you make it portable?" <laughs> <laughs> and uh, you yeah, know, we said. Our, the, our primary intention was to find out if it could be done, and, and that's a question for later on. So yeah, I, I think that would be the next stage, and that's something that we can. Uh, a, a team from um, Xtech now by the Nikon Metrology. Uh, if, I don't know if you've seen the documentary on the Antikythera mechanism, mm -hmm. a Greek mechanism that predicts the position of planets. They actually carted a, a two-ton system of something of that sort of size. Uh, over to Greece to look at that. So, can be done with enough will. <laughs> okay, um, one last question, or should we retire for drinks? Probably. Probably. <laughs> okay, I guess we'll start that. Thank you very much. Absolutely fantastic.